Good morning, um, and welcome. The, um, the more astute of you who are looking at your programmes may recognise that I'm not Jenny Mindell, uh, and actually I'm not going to talk about sex. Uh, I may talk a little bit about drugs at some point, uh, and not at all about rock and roll. Um, so I recently um, became interim director of the Institute of Epidemiology and Healthcare, which um, I, I have to say, even as an interim post, is a, is a, a true pleasure and an honour because uh, the Institute is one of the places in the country, if not the world, uh, that has done the most to understand uh, the causes of health throughout the life course. Um, the talk that I'm going to give you uh, is really going to focus on inequalities in health, or as I prefer to say, inequities in health. So this concept that um, the health experience of people is really very strongly related to uh, where they grew up, where they live, and the level of social deprivation and poverty uh, in those areas. Uh, and this is just one example, and this will be the only slide I show about uh, sexually transmitted infections. Uh, and so this is essentially looking at the rate of uh, consultations for sexually transmitted infections. In, uh, if you divide the, uh, the population and the areas of the population uh, into tenths according to uh, how socially deprived those areas are, so with the poorest 10% of areas on the left and the richest 10% of areas uh, on the right, then these are the consultation rates for sexually transmitted infections. Uh, and so you'll see um, again and again throughout my talk about the social grading uh, of disease experience. But I think even though you hear that, and I've heard that you know, throughout my time at medical school and uh, beyond, um, that, uh, that this is a problem, I think it's only really recently that I've started to appreciate the scale of this. Uh, as a problem. So if we think about the First World War, 1914 to 18, uh, so in Britain approximately a million people were killed uh, as a result of that war. What if I were to tell you that between 2007 and 2015 in England at least a million people died as a result of health inequity, so these inequalities uh, in health. So imagine, if you like, uh, I talked just now about having dividing the population into different areas uh, from the poorest to the richest. Imagine everybody could experience the same health outcomes as those in the richest areas. So if we all had the same life expectancy as those in the top 10% of areas, uh, how many lives uh, would be saved? And that's where I've come up with this figure of a million people uh, over uh, that time period from 2007 to 2015. We have monuments for those who died in the war, but where are the monuments for people who died of not being rich? This is my hometown where I grew up. Uh, my dad was a GP there. He treated patients. Uh, with various diseases, but I think ultimately he was frustrated, as I became frustrated in my medical career, about treating patients who turn up to hospital when actually most of the damage is done, and that we need to move uh, the emphasis on health back towards prevention and understanding the causes of health. One of the things that we all aspire to, of course, is to have a healthy working life and then to retire uh, and a happy retirement. But what about people who die before they get to retirement? Surely that has to be a, 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 a bad outcome as far as anybody's concerned. So if we look at the proportion of people who die prior to retirement and use that same logic of, well, what if those people uh, in the richest areas, if the rest of us had the same health expectancy as those people in the rich areas, how many of these deaths before the age of 65 would we prevent? It's about 40% in men and about a third of women. These are huge numbers of deaths. That's equivalent to my hometown being wiped out every year. So I just wanted to take you through. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. I'll take both 
I just wanted to take you through this concept, really, through the life course, thinking about the main causes of death uh, at different ages, uh, and then thinking about some of the inequalities that people are living through that may contribute towards these causes of death. So, in children under five, the main causes of death, congenital abnormalities, so problems that have occurred in the womb, um, uh, pneumonia and flu, uh, epilepsy, sadly, uh, amongst the top five causes of death uh, in infants is still um, uh, homicide, essentially, so children who may have been killed uh, by their parents or other people, uh, and brain cancers. If we move up into the slightly older uh, age group, the 5 to 19 year old uh, age group, we're seeing road traffic accidents, congenital abnormalities still playing a role, childhood cancer, epilepsy, but again, still death due to violence, so in uh, essentially homicide again, and increasingly teen suicide. These graphs essentially show over time, so from 2001 to 2015, the uh, death rate, the annual death rate in different age groups uh, in males at the top and females at the bottom. And we're comparing the poorest 10% of the population to the richest 10% of the population. And so in these infant mortality rates, I mean, these are tiny rates compared to, for example, in the uh, uh, developing world. Uh, but in the rich areas, we're getting maybe two or three per thousand uh, children dying before the age of one. In the poor areas, uh, it's about double that. And we see these same inequalities in the different age groups of children up to the age of 19. Again, you'll see as a common theme throughout this talk that actually for uh, some reason males seem to be more affected by uh, social inequalities uh, than females in terms of their health outcomes. So let's think about what it might mean in terms of to be uh, growing up uh, in areas of relatively uh, high social deprivation. So in all of these graphs that we'll see, again, uh, on the left-hand side we'll have the poorest areas of the country. On the right-hand side we'll have the richest areas of the country. Uh, and uh, so in this example we're thinking about teenage pregnancy, so pregnancy rates uh, under the age of 18. And again, highly socially divided. And so if you're born into... Uh, some of these areas, you're more likely, for example, to be born uh, into a family where your um, um, mother was a teenager. You're more likely uh, to be born to a mother who's a smoker. You're more likely to be born to a mother who's not going to breastfeed. You're more likely to be growing up in a single parent household. You're much more likely to be living in poverty. You're likely to be living in families where nobody works uh, in the whole household. By the age of five, you're less likely to have a good level of development. You're likely to live in a noisy and overcrowded environment. It's more likely that your parents are going to suffer from problems with alcohol addiction and drug addiction. And it's also more likely that you're going to be referred into social services as in need of support. And the main reason for people being referred into social services is uh, domestic violence within the home. And you're more likely to end up in care. I think you can guess which side of the divide these children uh, come from. Uh, but educational outcomes are also not as good, although actually the slope here is less severe. 
And I think one of the key important things, if we look internationally at the role of education in insulating against this effect of health inequality, is that it's one of the main factors that can help to uh, prevent some of the health outcomes uh, of uh, growing up in poorer areas. And in fact, the, lo the, the longer people spend in education, the more impact that has on their life expectancy. The children growing up in those areas are more likely to be obese. From the ages of 16 to 18, they're more likely not to be in education, employment or training. They're more likely to end up in the criminal justice system. So this all feels very depressing, but there is uh, a lot that can actually be done about it and that has been done about it over the years. Uh, so in all of these areas and across the country, the health outcomes uh, in most areas have improved uh, and they have improved across all of the different uh, uh, areas of social deprivation. Um, and so some of the things that you can do about this is, of course, tackling child poverty. So how do you do that? Well, really, that's a matter for the government, largely, and it's about wealth redistribution and how we use our taxes uh, and the benefits that we can give people. It's about initiatives like the Sure Start uh, programs, um, which are across all areas, but particularly uh, within more socially deprived areas, where trying to give uh, young children and their parents more support, uh, more education and linking into social services in order to uh, improve uh, expectations and uh, future school performance and health. We can do things uh, as population health people like the childhood obesity strategy, which you'll have heard about on the news. You can see how proud the government were of their childhood obesity strategy, I think, by the amount of effort they put into the cover uh, of it. In fact, the contents of it are similarly uh, relatively blank. Um, about the extent of their uh, dealing with the childhood obesity uh, issue is looking uh, at uh, increasing the prices of sugary drinks and... Uh, what was in the news this morning uh, was around the uh, voluntary regulation of the industry in order to reduce the amount of sugar uh, in a range of about nine different products by about a massive 20%. And the sorts of products that they're looking at there are things like, you know, everybody knows they're full of sugar anyway, right? Um, uh, so they're looking at those, they're looking at cakes, biscuits, uh, yogurts, cereals, but they're not looking at things like where a lot of the hidden sugars are, you know, in your takeaway lasagna uh, and things like that, or, or in your what looks like a healthy uh, jug full of soup. Uh, there's hidden sugars in all of these processed foods, and uh, we're really not taking this to a serious level in terms of our response to this as a public health crisis. Other public health initiatives, uh, like the Teenage Pregnancy Initiative, have been uh, a big success. And a lot of that, again, is about education uh, and making sure that there is uh, equal access to sex education across, uh, uh, across the community uh, and also making available contraception. So let's move on to... Uh, young adults in the 20 to 49 year old age group and the major causes of death there. So again, suicide, particularly in young men, uh, is one of the leading causes of death. Uh, road traffic accidents, uh, homicide, again in, in young men, one of the leading causes of death. Uh, and drug overdose. Uh, and increasingly we're seeing liver disease uh, as a major cause of death, even in people this young. Uh, as well as lung cancer, heart disease, and in women, breast cancer being one of the most common causes. And again, look at the inequality here. This is the death rates in people in the 20 to 49 year old age group uh, in the poorest areas. This is the death rate in, sorry, this is the richest areas. This is the poorest areas. Look at the extent of that inequality. It's mind-blowing to my mind. 
So here's actually one. You occasionally see some things that where you don't get a clear social divide uh, in the number of deaths. So, for example, this is road traffic accidents, where actually you're more likely to die in a road traffic accident if you come from a rich area than a poor area. Of course, you're also more likely to have a car uh, and be able to drive. Uh, so I think, you know, things like this and skiing accidents, uh, you may get a different uh, social picture. So again, looking through at the uh, environmentals that people are living with uh, in these circumstances, this is the proportion of people who are long-term unemployed. And now, employment levels have increased uh, a lot compared to uh, decades ago, but there still is a core uh, of people who are in long-term unemployment and whose families have been in long-term unemployment. Uh, and also I think it's, it's worth noting that the nature of employment itself has changed and that many of the people who are now classified as living in poverty uh, are working. Uh, so the amount of income that people are getting when they are employed uh, seems to, uh, despite the minimum wage, not be enough for it to be a living wage for a family. Again, this is the adult smoking prevalence uh, by... Uh, by geographical area. And again, these things have in, improved a lot uh, uh, over the last few decades through intensive public health efforts, but there's still a big divide. These are the rates of alcoholic liver disease uh, and admissions for alcoholic liver disease. And here there's an interesting paradox. You get a situation where Actually, if you look at the level, the total level of alcohol drunk across different uh, social groups, then uh, rich people and middle class people do quite, do quite well and drink quite a lot. But the pattern of alcohol use, I think, is likely to be different. So there's less in the uh, way of binge drinking, uh, for example. Uh, which, uh, and so it's the patterns of alcohol use that may lead to more harm. Um, again, this is showing if you're in these poorer areas, you're more likely to become homeless. And when we think of homelessness, we shouldn't just think of have you got a roof over your head. These are families who are living in temporary accommodation, overcrowded, very poor conditions. And uh, this is also, this is people uh, who've been identified as being homeless, but they've been told that they're not in priority need. Uh, so they're unlikely to get um, any accommodation anytime soon. Uh, and then they genuinely might end up on the street uh, or in hostels for homeless people. Injecting drug use, again, much, much higher uh, according to the level of social deprivation. Uh, and... If we had the statistics, we would also see that the prison population is very highly socially graded. The reason this graph looks different is because uh, this is where the prisons are rather than where the prisoners came from. And again, this is the suicide rate, your chance of being involved in a violent assault. So again, what sort of things can we do to tackle these um, gross inequities. Well, uh, so this is the uh, government's plan about smoking, and I think tobacco is a really good example where we've exerted strong public health uh, control, uh, both in terms of trying to make it culturally less acceptable, but also particularly in racking up the price of uh, cigarettes again and again consistently each year through taxation. Uh, through advertising bans, through packaging bans, uh, through um, not smoking in public spaces. And we've, we've had a huge impact on smoking. But I think the, the new epidemics of uh, obesity, for example, uh, demand a similar level of attention. And the amount of attention that we put into public health measures to reduce alcohol is uh, really minuscule. So this is showing the... Uh, essentially the relationship between alcohol price over years uh, and alcohol consumption. And alcohol really has become very cheap. In, if you go into a supermarket, you can buy some types of alcohol cheaper than you can buy water. Uh, 
we live in an obesogenic environment with um, many fast food outlets with uh, unhealthy food. And actually, if you look uh, at the sorts of food outlets that you get in different geographical areas, uh, if you go to a really socially deprived area, the sorts of food on offer uh, are, uh, tend to be much less healthy. Drug-related deaths have hit a record high uh, in this country. Uh, and I think that's partly because of uh, the way that we fund uh, and run drug treatment services. So, for example, they used to be part of the NHS, but then they were transferred to the responsibility of local authorities. And as we all know, local authorities are now uh, having huge amounts of money removed for them, and drug treatment services are an easy target to remove uh, support from. Uh, there's also been a move away from trying to maintain people on methadone treatment uh, to trying to essentially enforce a recovery agenda uh, whereby people kind of go without any substitute therapy. And I think that's also leading to higher mortality rates. So let's move on into my age group, uh, the pre-retirement uh, age group. And here, the sorts of diseases we're seeing are the ones that you may sort of more typically think of as medical problems. Uh, so lung cancer, colon cancer, uh, emphysema and chronic obstructive airways disease, heart disease, breast cancer, liver disease still. And again, we're seeing this huge social gradient in your chances of dying just before you get up to the uh, age uh, of retirement. And again, it's worse for men than it is for women. And I think we can see from the previous slides about how the accumulation of lifestyle factors and inequalities in health uh, leads to these deaths uh, at this age. What about the elderly? So their main causes of death, well, I've I suppose you're not really elderly if you're over 65, although actually if you come from a really poor area, you may feel pretty elderly by the time you're 65. Uh, so here we've got diseases, again, stroke coming into the picture, prostate cancer for men coming into the picture, uh, pneumonias uh, coming into the picture again, and then a big one, uh, dementia. So and interestingly, when we look at these older age groups, we see, if you like, less of a social divide in mortality. But if you think about it, that's not so surprising. So, for example, if you, if you think about people between the ages of 90 and 100, uh, then um, almost all of them are going to die during that time period. So whether you're rich or poor, you're almost all going to die during that time period. And so part of it's that effect. Part of it may also be what you might think of as the healthy survivor effect. Uh, so people who managed to survive that long uh, may be the people who had healthier lifestyles anyway. Uh, and so you're seeing less of a difference uh, in mortality rates. It's still there, but it's less extreme. But we do see inequalities. So, for example, fuel poverty, people living in houses that they can't afford to heat which will increase their chances of being admitted for pneumonia, for example. Loneliness, people living in isolation uh, without uh, anybody coming to see them. And actually the overall quality of life. So this is a scale of sort of self-reported quality of life where you essentially scale it from zero, the worst possible, to one, the best possible. And again, we can see that people living in poorer areas are... Uh, have a lower uh, quality of life. So, a lot of this health inequity is really down to the distribution of wealth within a society. So this is showing um, wealth distribution across the different tenths of the society in terms of uh, a total income, uh, uh, but total income before uh, any taxation uh, and after, or, or benefits and total income after. So the, the orange bar here is the amount of income after you've received benefits. Up in this rich group, it's the amount of uh, this is what they earn, this is what they keep. So you can immediately see from that 
that if we were to be able to redistribute wealth more equally across society, it's not, a, it's not an implausible phenomenon that we would be able to dramatically increase health. And this is essentially showing it in another way. So the richest 10% of the population own 45% of the wealth uh, of our nation. I was going to say things could get worse, but uh, it does worry me extremely the way in which politics is going at the moment, how we're going to continue to address health inequalities uh, in the current environment. Uh, this is a map of the world scaled according to the proportion of people who own over $200 per day. And you can see it's completely distorting the geography of the world. And the inequalities that I've described in health across England pale into insignificance, really, when you consider the health inequalities globally. Oxfam recently estimated that the world's eight richest people have the same wealth as the poorest 50%. So I think this council that inequalities are just something that we have to put up with is wrong. There's enough money around, it's just in the wrong places. Here's an interesting graph that looks at life expectancy on this scale in different countries around the world according to their gross domestic product, so the amount of money that uh, is made per person. And what you can see here is that there's a very clear relationship between uh, um, national income uh, and life expectancy in these poorer countries. But once you become a rich country like us, there's very little relationship between the two. And in fact, what you see in those richer countries is that it's the distribution of wealth rather than the absolute amount of wealth that affects um, your life expectancy within that country. And more quotes from uh, Donald Trump. Point is, you can never be too greedy. The beauty of me is that I'm very rich. And so I just wanted to show you a few graphs again from some of these richer countries to think about a, a country like the USA, which I really think of as the home of health inequality uh, in terms of how it distributes its wealth. And this is, again, looking at infant deaths versus income inequality. Where's America? It's right up here. And this is in a country that's thinking of trying to remove its universal health coverage. When we look at obesity, where's America? Right up here. Donald Trump has some good policies, I think, on this. We look at maths and literacy. Where's America? Right over here. And school dropout rates across states in the United States are uh, essentially highly graded according to the level of wealth in those areas. The Trump response, well, people are spending too much public money on education. Teenage pregnancy, where's America? Up here. What did Trump, Donald Trump have to say about this in a typically pleasant way? Teenage mothers shouldn't get public assistance unless they jump through some pretty small hoops. Making them live in group homes makes sense. Drug use. Where's America? Where is it? Here. <laughs> and interestingly, Donald Trump changed his view on drugs and how we control drugs. So before he was really fighting to be a politician, he was arguing uh, for legalization of drugs uh, under the concept that <coughs> actually uh, a lot of the harm of drugs comes out of the associated criminal activity and, and uh, an inability to regulate a market that is illegal. Uh, but now he's very much into the, well, actually it's all down to the Mexicans uh, importing uh, drugs into our country. Homicide. Where is America? <laughs> Up there. Okay, so this is gun control. Uh, but it's also uh, the levels of deaths uh, from guns are highest in the poorest areas. Here's another Trumpism. 
If you take your guns away from the good people, the bad ones are going to have target practice. Imprisonment. There's America here. They, America imprisons an extraordinary proportion of its population, especially if you happen to be poor and black. And here's again uh, the liberal thinking uh, Donald. I want to hate these muggers and murderers. They should be forced to suffer, and when they kill, they should be executed for their crimes. So again, this is just to really show that it's not just a UK issue, um, but it's important. And, and UCL really has uh, a very proud record of tackling health inequalities. Uh, so uh, Professor Sir Michael Marmot, who teaches on the course, uh, is, has really done perhaps more than anybody else in the world to highlight this issue of the unacceptability of these inequities uh, in health. Uh, this is a report that he did for our, uh, for our government about, called Fair Society, Healthy Lives, which is trying to think about how we tackle um, these problems of health inequality. Um, and it goes into more detail, but essentially it's about things like <coughs> giving every chance, child the best chance in life. So initiatives like Sure Start help with that, tackling child poverty help with that, enabling all children, young people and adults to maximise their capabilities and control over their lives, creating fair employment and, and good quality work for people, ensuring a healthy standard of living for all, and part of that helps to influence the decision to have a minimum wage at all, uh, creating and developing healthy and sustainable places and communities. A lot of this is about strengthening communities to be more resilient. Uh, and also, of course, uh, health promotion. But I think we want to get away from the fact that it's as simple as just telling people you've got to stop smoking, you've got to stop smoking. It's not that simple, or it wouldn't be so socially graded. Uh, this is Michael Marmot's recent book. And this is one of the sort of iconic graphs from within uh, his reports, which is showing at very small area level life expectancy uh, in the top line according to how poor the area is. Uh, and in the bottom line, healthy life expectancy, so how long you can expect to live in good health. Uh, and again, you know, the gap between those living in the poorest areas and the richest areas is similar to what I've seen. But there's optimism in this as well. Uh, so, you know, people here are doing quite well despite levels of, um, um, of poverty that are quite high. So what is it about these neighbourhoods that's different from these neighbourhoods? I think that's a, a really interesting question, the sort of question that you can learn to try and answer uh, through this course. This is the United States, again, showing that slope that we just showed. And here the slope becomes a cliff. So in these very poorest areas, we're seeing an extreme increase uh, in mortality. And a lot of that is related to uh, guns, drugs, violence within those areas. So speaking of cliffs, just as I uh, wind up, I do a lot of work with um, homeless populations who I think uh, really exhibit uh, extreme levels of social exclusion. Uh, and this is a study that was looking across, doing interviews with homeless people to think about the life experiences that they had and the age that they had them at. And the sorts of things that we're seeing is, you know, many people will, may have got into minor levels of addiction like sniffing solvents or things at some point, many of them in local authority care, many of them having to leave home because of parental, uh, parental disruption, uh, many of them being uh, involved in domestic violence or physical or sexual abuse, many of them suffering from uh, episodes of violent crime, uh, people getting into street drinking, becoming involved in crime themselves, becoming involved in drugs. Uh, it goes on and on. But you can see that the accumulation of these broader societal forces can, in a way, concentrate in some of the most vulnerable people in our society. And then this cliff, so this is a, a survey that we did. You heard about the health survey for England earlier. Uh, what we did is we thought, well, the health survey for England kind of surveys a, a general population, really. And we can look across the 
the, the basic levels of social deprivation for how common different conditions are. And then we can look in the homeless, who don't really feature in these surveys, and we can see a big disparity in health inequalities there. So that was for anxiety, but also for these chronic diseases, heart disease, epilepsy, stroke. So here the slope becomes a cliff. And when we think about these relative mortality between the poorest areas and the richest areas, typically we're talking about a two-fold increase uh, in mortality rates. In the homeless and drug users, we're talking about a tenfold increase. This is just around the corner uh, outside our hospital, UCLH. These are some pictures I took the other night, uh, again, just around the corner, just to show that uh, inequality happens at all levels. Uh, these people got quite a small mattress. These people have had the initiative to get themselves a really thick mattress. But then we live on a thin sheet of ice. This was the next day. Uh, so comparative advantage can disappear very quickly. And in fact, for many people, I think it's worth considering that many of us could only be a few paychecks away from being homeless. So I think when we think about health inequity, we also need to think about the whole slope, uh, as well as people at the very uh, extreme ends of this. So I've focused today on talking about health inequity as I think one of the most fundamental drivers uh, of health in a population. But actually there are of course many other uh, drivers. Uh, and this is a report um, which I recommend you reading actually if you're interested in, in going into population health. It was led by uh, Professor Dayman Johnson from UCL uh, and from our institute. Um, and it's about what population health should look like come 2040. And it's really recognizing the fact that health is very much influenced by many, many different environments. The natural and built environment, demographic, cultural and social, political, economic and commercial, digital and technological, educational and occupational, health and social care, behavioral, and also, of course, influenced by our biology. Uh, and, of course, influenced uh, by health inequalities uh, and the broader global context of disease. And one of the advantages of UCL as a university is we have expertise in all of these areas and we're aiming in this course as much as possible to provide you with opportunities to get inputs from these different areas so that you can gain a broad view of population health. Uh, and I would really recommend population health to you. I, you know, I went into it through the medicine route uh, and became disillusioned with medicine, in fact. Uh, and actually, the, the way in which I improve health now is through population health skills of the sort that are taught on this course. Uh, there's lots of opportunities uh, for people to work at all sorts of levels, from local level, um, in local authorities, local charities, uh, health services, through to regional, national, and international levels of WHO. It's a, it's a really fascinating field. Uh, and I think it's one that can generally start to help in tackling these underlying health inequalities, which I hope you agree are unacceptable. Thank you.